Welcome to anyone watching. This video shows the intercom panel that I've built for the A10C for use with DCS. It's got four parts to this unit, so it's actually four panels in one. You've got the intercom panel, the store volume panel, the antenna panel, and then finally the ground safety switch. But I've built them all into the one unit. So the biggest part of the unit is uh, the intercom panel section. So I'll refer to the overall unit as the intercom panel. So I'm just shining a light on it here so we can have a real close up look at it. And at the bottom of the panel I've left four screw holes there um, so I can later on install some kind of a utility light uh, to reflect what it actually has in the, the real A10C. The top two parts of this panel, which are the intercom and store volume, um, are controlled by DCS BIOS. And the bottom two parts, um, the antenna panel and ground safety switch, are controlled by keyboard encoder. In reflecting on the panel now that I've finished building it, there are three aspects of it that I'm pleased with in terms of how it replicates what's happening in the sim. And one, uh, functional improvement to the panel over to what's happening in the sim. In terms of the functional improvement that I found works for me, in the actual sim the uh, text for the top row of dials sits below that row and then the text for the bottom row of dials sits above so at a glance all that text is quite bunched up and close together so when building this panel I've lifted the text from below the top, the top row to above it and I have found that it does make it a lot clearer at a glance what text relates to what dial. I mentioned that there were um, a few parts of this build that I was pleased with in terms of how it replicates what's happening in the sim. The first is are the volume control dials that I'm testing right now. I did spend quite some time looking at components for volume control which would have an integrated uh, mute and mute um, and I did look at I started by looking at rotor encoders and I found that the the mute and mute selection was was obviously momentary using that type of component so visually when you then looked at the dials it was not clear whether they were in the mute or unmute position so I therefore moved on to push-pull potentiometers and at that point I was having the mute or mute control would be in one of two lock positions but I did find that some components didn't have enough travel in the actuator to be really clear of its position, uh, position visually so after a fair bit of research and some testing of, of different components um, I was happy with um, the ones that I've put into the panel here um, the amount of travel in its actuation uh, does let you see visually its position it also reflects quite closely what's happening in, in the sim so if we look now at the replication of that mute and mute feature you can see as I push them in it's reflected in the sim and it visually you can definitely see that it's in a different position and then as I pull those out, again, the travel is very similar to what's happening in the sim. So for the intercom portion of this unit, um, definitely happy with the text around the uh, volume control dials and the replication of the mute and mute feature within them. The intercom panel, like a few of the others within the A10C, uh, have a dial uh, for the mode select in this case, where the text of the dial sits on the dial itself. That's something that I've not replicated exactly. Um, mine's still just a dial that points to some engraved text. So down the line, it might be that I do revisit that on some of the future panels and try and get that in place too. We take a look now uh, further down into the unit at the store volume control section. Quite pleased with the uh, 
knobs that I've found here very closely reflect um, what we have in the actual sim and then we've got some standard toggles for the uh, antenna control the final two aspects that I was pleased with within this unit um, from a replication point of view were for the ground safety control switch so I wanted the sim to reflect the actual physical position of the toggle protector and after a fair bit of testing um, I found a way for it to, to work reliably so we'll have a quick look at that now just to see how it updates in the sim the final um, aspect of the panel that I wanted to make closely reflect the sim was the uh, labelling of the ground safety text which is punctuated by a red background and I wanted that to be uh, backlit too so my initial thoughts of just putting the red label on I did move past that to make sure I'd uh, painted it and then engraved through that for anyone that's interested in building something like this I'll now run into some construction notes for this particular unit So there were four main areas to look at and going through these four, the first was the toggle protector in the sense that we want it to be position detectable. Then we had the ground safety switch text and for that text we wanted it punctuated with a red background whilst backlit. And then we had the push-pull potentiometers that they need to have an appropriate actuator travel. And then finally, just to look at the general build in terms of material prep, wiring and unit testing. So within this panel, I will want a toggle protector because that's what we have as part of the ground safety switch. So I want the sim to be able to update to reflect the position of the physical toggle protector, which is this. So the real question is, how can we get the sim to understand whether it's in the closed position or the open position? How can we do that? So that's something that I spent quite a bit of time looking at and thinking about. So I started to picture it in terms of, imagine that the toggle is integrated into that and this sitting below the um, acrylic panel and obviously this bit sitting above it how can I make the sim understand its position so the point I arrived at is what about if we were to remove this overhang of metal here which this presses up against because as you open this it actually forms a very strong close. There's a good bit of downward pressure on this bit here. So what we could do is remove this bit, cut it flat, and then if we were to introduce a momentary push button, and that could sit in place of where that metal overhang was, and when this opens, it will press this down. And again, when it's closed, it will it will release that. So that was what I started planning to do. So the more I looked and trialled and, and tested this, I found that if this was to protrude there, it simply is too high. So what I needed to do was look at the acrylic and machine it so that there'd be a recess for this to sit lower down. So what we have here is a CAD CAM file for uh, machining and engraving. And what we're particularly interested in here is the missile toggle protector, which is this here. So if we have a closer look at that, jump into one of the layers. So the one I'm selecting and deselecting here, that's the outline of the rear of the toggle 
and what will sit behind the acrylic. And this outline reflects the footprint of the toggle protector prior to cutting off the overhang of metal. So we can see where it sits in relation to this bit here. Now, looking at the cutouts here where the momentary switch would protrude through and this outer circle here is important because this is a recess that we're going to machine into the material so it will sit lower down. It won't protrude too much for the opening of the missile protector cover to then fully depress and hold down that momentary switch. If we have a closer look at some of the tool paths and specifically this recess pocket, um, what you can see here is we're going to create a recess which will machine to a depth of 1.5 mil. And if we look at that against what is the overall dimensions of the material, the material has a thickness of 3 mil. So we're going to basically machine halfway into the total thickness of the material. That's enough for it to not protrude too much, but at the same time we can't machine too much further because what's left will be brittle and when you mount that momentary switch it may just break. So if we have a look now at a preview of how it will machine, um, let's get rid of that waste material there for where the toggle goes through. But this particular bit here you can see the hole is where the momentary switch will come through but it sits in a pocket and that will allow it to not protrude too much. I did find that for it to work reliably, you do need to get the depth of the recess exactly right for the switch that you've chosen. And that's the only way to be certain that the toggle cover when it's open will properly hold down that momentary switch. This is one of my tests to implement the toggle protector. This was when I was working on my KY58 encryption panel. But you can see now the momentary switch and how the movement of the toggle cover holds that down. And in doing so, it creates a circuit. And what we now need to do is check that it can properly talk to the SIM. So now we have a look at an error that occurs when we're using the toggle protector and the toggle within it in unison. When I lift up the toggle protector, it updates within the SIM. And when I close it, that updates too. And when it's open, if I move the toggle within it, you can just about see that within the SIM, that does update as it does when you deselect it. But what we see now is the actual fault. And that is if I lift the toggle protector, flick the toggle within it, watch what happens now when I close it. The toggle protector within the SIM bounced back up and it's no longer in line with the physical panel. The reason for that is as the physical toggle protector moves, that updates within the SIM as the toggle protector closing and the toggle within it moving but in the movement of the actual physical toggle protector it then encounters moving the physical toggle itself and that then sends another update within the sim to move the, the toggle so that's why the toggle protector within the sim bounces back open for this panel the ground safety switch in terms of the toggle and the toggle protector have been interfaced by keyboard encoder. Whereas normally each switch would have its own activation and deactivation sequence, the solution here was to program the activation of the toggle protector to create an input only on activation but to do nothing on deactivation and then it was the deactivation of the toggle within it which would close the toggle protector and move the toggle within it. So to confirm that point when the physical toggle protector closes whilst we know that deactivates a circuit 
the keyboard encoders program not to recognize that, not to send any keyboard command as a result. And when the physical toggle within the protector deactivates, I've programmed the keyboard encoder to send two commands within the SIM. One to deactivate the toggle within the SIM and the other to deactivate the toggle protector within the SIM. There was a, another solution I'd tried where I'd programmed the keyboard encoder so upon closing the toggle protector there was a delay of 1.5 seconds which would enable the other toggle within it to execute its command before then the cover closed. However, the way the keyboard encoder works is once it starts a one instruction, even though there's a delay, it won't begin executing the other one until that's fully completed, so that didn't actually work. The reason that I mention that here is because, although I've used a keyboard encoder, a lot of people may use DCS BIOS, so it may be that of those two possible solutions, one may work with DCS BIOS, whereas it didn't actually work with the keyboard encoder. For the ground safety switch text, I took some time to work out just approximate size of the shape and background that will be spray painted red and sketch that out and then used it to create a cutout on which I could then spray through. And I made sure that the CAD CAM file had aligned where the text would be engraved to fit inside that spray painted red area. And other than a, a tidy up needed around the edges, it came out just fine. I tested lots of different kinds of components to find the right one for what would be the volume control for the different systems with some form of integrated switch. So what I'm testing is a rotary encoder. It does have an integral switch, but it's momentary, so there's no travel, and there's no end position for where the dial would, the marker would go to. And what we come to now is the final component, which was one I used. It's a 10K potentiometer with a push-pull lever and the actuation of that has a good amount of travel. Um, it is dual pull and dual throw, so you've got all kinds of options for wiring it up, but uh, worked really well, so definitely went with that one. So with the component chosen, really important now to try and pick the right knob to, to mount there. I did find that some of the ones that had uh, a spline to attach to the shaft when you use the pull push feature, they literally would just come straight off. So some of the knobs that have a grub screw to tighten them tend to give it the best hold. In machining the acrylic, double-sided sticky tape is used to hold the material in place. So in terms of the, the general build, um, good time to give a shout out to my father-in-law, Phil. So thanks, Phil, for your very kind use of your CNC machine. I really appreciate it. And also uh, a shout out and thank you to FSF Ian, who's a creator of DCS BIOS, an amazing piece of software, which has been used for one half of this whole panel. And it's really nice to see the panel come to life as we cut into the acrylic. And when it's finished being machined, uh, we give it a bit of a tidy up and dust it down, and then we're ready to start wiring it up. The greatest number of potentiometers I've used to this point with DCS BIOS is two, and that was with the auxiliary lighting panel. This overall unit will use a total of 12 potentiometers. So I begin my test now to run a number of them at the same time and start bringing them all online to check the working as they should be. Whereas some of the backlighting previously has special connectors that would uh, allow the different parts of the strip to be put together, um, I'm now just soldering it all myself. The little cut pieces of wire, I'm just using some electrical tape to hold in place. 
So I can then solder it and then we can now see the after. With the LED strips all soldered together, we can look to power it up, bring it online, check that it's all fine. Obviously, I've only backlit the parts of the panel that would need backlighting. So if we just take a moment to have a look at the rear of the panel from just one side across to the other, so we can see all the components, we can see how they're wired. The 12 potentiometers used are made up of nine push-pull potentiometers and three ordinary potentiometers. So that's another panel completed for the left console. All I have left is the trim panel and the emergency brake panel to do, and then I can actually build the left console to mount them into. It'll be really nice to have one full completed console that's permanently in place to use when I fly the A10C rather than at the minute just having a whole series of individual complete panels just sitting around. I hope that the extra footage I've added on around its construction is of some value and thanks for watching.